So um, first and foremost, um, World Women's Day today. Uh, second thing that I wanted to tell people about was not that I'm trying to buy a bike, uh, <laughs> is our uh, seminar speaker this week, tomorrow, is Dr. Brad Tebow from OHSU, who may be trying to move his research program here. Uh, he does some really fascinating work with microbes and manganese. You know, who knew that manganese was so important? Um, haven't talked about it yet, but it turns out it's really critical for DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase. So it's not just for these purposes uh, that we're interested in, in manganese. Uh, third thing is that our guest lecturer on Friday, um, George Kaysen from my group, um, I'm going to try and convince him to wear all this stuff and record stuff and so on and so forth. Uh, he'll be talking about small RNAs and particularly CRISPRs. Um, so the clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats. I'm not going to expect you to remember it. Um, don't worry. So <clears throat> with that, today um, we're going to finish up with regulation, um, other than the, the CRISPR and the, the short RNA stuff. Um, if we get to, we'll talk a little bit about the long non-coding RNAs um, today as well. I want to start out with DNA methylation, basically where we got to last time. Uh, DNA methylation um, is a pretty major problem as far as DNA repair is concerned. Why is that? What's the second most common DNA damage that happens all the time? Deaminations of cytosines. If you have a 5-methyl cytosine up here, methyl group hidden under our little clicker thing, um, you deaminate this, you end up with thymidine, um, which is clearly a major issue because you don't have any kind of DNA repair machinery that's specifically going to cut out thymidine. If you did, we'd have all kinds of problems. So <clears throat> what we've, however, found is that there's actually quite a lot of 5-methylcytosine that's present in our genomes. And it turns out that most of this 5-methylcytosine ends up in these things called CPG islands. So what the heck is a CPG island? So the P here actually just stands for phosphate. So it's a CG dinucleotide. Of course, in the opposite strand, it's going to be from 5' prime to 3' prime CG on the other side here. And it turns out that these are very commonly found in the genome just right together with this CG sequence. And there are lots and lots of them, literally thousands of them um, all together or very high concentrations thereof. So how do you get this kind of methylation? Um, happens through a wonderful, again, term here, the maintenance methyltransferase or methylase. Um, if you have hemimethylated DNA, um, and this is true, by the way, in eukaryotic systems. You don't see it anywhere near as much in, in bacteria. But in eukaryotic systems, particularly the human genome, as soon as you have a hemimethylated sequence, so just one of the two strands is methylated, this is what happens right after replication, you have methylation that happens on the other strand as well. And so it's another way of giving a epigenetic change because it's not changing the genetic information here, but it's changing the state of your DNA. Um, methylation comes and goes. Um, it's pretty dynamic, and as we'll see in just a second here, it's really important for a lot of aspects of development. So if you have mutations or some kind of decrease in the maintenance methyltransferase, um, all kinds of diseases um, will happen um, based on that. But the main thing as far as regulation is concerned, DNA methylation usually leads to gene silencing, i.e. shutting down any kind of expression from genes that are coded in these regions, which have these <clears throat> CPG methylation islands. But it's only part of gene silencing that takes place. Um, we've already talked about modification of histones. So you have modification of histones. Usually this will be, interestingly enough, also methylation of histones in terms of getting heterochromatin. 
So you'll have modification of histones, but in many cases, actually, these DNA methylases, and these are the extra methylation above and beyond that maintenance methylase, which will associate with methylated histones. So first you methylate your histones, then you're going to methylate the DNA. So you not only have compacted DNA, it's also methylated. And so that's what really seems to be most important for getting this kind of really true genome silencing. And just here, you know, 10 to the 6, you can get a million-fold difference in expression of a particular gene if it's silenced or if it's not silenced. Um, and it's pretty amazing that, you know, million-fold difference in terms of the expression. And this is just at the RNA level. Um, and again, most of that's based on both compaction of your chromatin, again, mostly methylation of histones, and methylation of the DNA. And it turns out that this is probably why most of the transposons in our genome are not jumping around all the time. Um, as we've talked about, probably ad nauseum in this class, 40% of our genomes is made up of these transposable elements that could be jumping all over the place. Uh, probably the reason that they don't very much is because they're shut down due to this methylation, both of histones and of the DNA. Exactly how that works is a very open question, and we're trying to figure out um, what's going on with that. So um, this is now as a specific kind of methylation, again, specific for gene silencing. There are, however, um, some regions of the genome where you see a lot of CGs together, and this is relatively rare in the genome. This is a, an interesting question about, so why wouldn't you have too many of these CPGs or CG sequences present in the genome? Well, the reason really has to do with what happens when you have deamination of 5-methylcytosine. You end up with thymidine. So you end up with AT base pairs instead of GC base pairs. And over long periods of time, i.e. evolutionary time, you'll have anything which gets methylated on a regular basis will get transferred to an AT unless there's some kind of selection to leave it GC. You know, evolutionarily, if it really is important that you have a GC there, it's going to stay GC. If it's not that evolutionarily important, you can switch it to an AT, it will get switched to an AT. What this means is that, again, there are relatively few of these regions. We've got lots of Gs and Cs. And it turns out, not surprisingly, that lots of these CPG islands are right in front of where you have gene control regions. Why? Because those are the regions that you can't change the sequence that much. Because that's where you have to have your general transcription factors binding, any of the cis-acting transcriptional regulators that sit down right next to the promoter. So it turns out that you find in the human genome about 20,000 of these CPG islands. How many protein coding genes do we have? About 20,000. So it's actually one way to identify these genes actually pretty well. They say, okay, I've got a CPG island. Let's look for promoters around there. And it turns out that they um, map really quite closely to these things. And it's particularly true of genes that are being transcribed at a high amount in pretty much all cell types. Um, and the classic example of that is down here at the bottom, um, ribosomal protein genes. You need to make ribosomal proteins all the time. You know, massive numbers of ribosomes. Each of those ribosomes needs a bunch of proteins. Every cell needs to translate. So not surprising that we've got these <clears throat> CPG islands um, present right here at the beginning of these you know, housekeeping genes regularly transcribe genes. He's pausing. What does that mean? You have to ask lots of questions and slow me down. <laughs> or we can have a quicker question. So why is it likely that CPG islands are located in promoters? Because they're preferentially methylated, random chance, because they're protected from methylation by DNA binding proteins, because they're protected from methylation by barrier sequence binding proteins, they're protected from methylation by insulator binding proteins. None of those answers. Sorry, we don't have an F down at the bottom here, they're clickers. 
mice in here today? Ten. Vote early, vote often. Five. Okay, before I move it over here completely, preferentially methylated, random chance, protected by DNA binding protein, or barrier sequence binding proteins and insulator binding proteins. Um, most people think C. Fortunately, I agree with you. Um, why is that? What kinds of DNA binding proteins are we talking about here? Transcriptional regulators. So that's why you're going to find them in promoters. And those, those, those transcriptional regulatory proteins, which are binding there. Um, we'll actually look at some barrier proteins and insulator binding proteins um, in just a second, because it turns out that you also have methylation in some of those places as well. So C is our answer. So <clears throat> what about methylation? Um, yeah, sure, you can methylate, you can do gene silencing, et cetera. It turns out that DNA methylation is also important for something called genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting is really bizarre. Um, and basically what genomic imprinting is, is it is a way that the cell, the organism, if a diploid organism knows whether a particular gene came from mom or from dad. Of course, you know, the mom's genes, again, International Women's Day, so the much, much more important ones here. Um, but the reason that people found out about this is they were looking at our, you know, everyone's favorite Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, how often do you get different alleles remixing, and they found that there was some very strange inheritance going on with a lot of these different genes, a lot of these different alleles. And it was found then later that this all had to do with methylation, but not so much the CPG methylation, but very specific methylation happening at very specific sequences, not just CGs, but whole stretches of DNA sequence. So what <clears throat> is going on here is outlined basically here where we have, oops, let's see, let's see if this is actually going to work. Oh, no, we're not working here. Yeah, look at my, <clears throat> my controller. Here we are. Uh, so in this particular case, the imprinted gene is a paternal gene. So we have imprinting and the methylation here are just these little red lollipops um, on either side. Um, because each time you have gametogenesis, you have to wipe out all of this imprinting because you, know, you don't know. In this case, this is your female mouse on this side. You know, it's gotten its imprinted gene from its father, but it's going to be passing on the female genes. It's only going to be the male genes here which get imprinted. And so here, we can actually have two different alleles. So we'll start out here as the paternal, the grandparental allele here, the orange one. That one is imprinted, but we've also got a grand maternal allele. It's the yellow one. Those both then are going to get imprinted in the male. The offspring here are going to have differences in terms of which allele is actually imprinted. And so again, it just has to do with the chromosome that's being inherited from you know, either the mom or the dad. In this particular case, it's the dad. There's also other examples um, as well here. It's about 100 genes in the human genome. So it's a relatively small number that actually have this imprinting that takes place. And normally, this kind of imprinting, again, DNA methylation, is going to not allow your regulatory proteins to bind to it. It's going to shut down whatever genes are right next to it. But there are a couple of interesting examples where exactly the opposite of tr is true. And one of those is shown here. It's not important what the genes are. That's why I'm not going to mention them too much. But I had one of the answers for that clicker question about 
insulator sequences being methylated. Well, an insulator sequence can't work just by itself. What does it need? So an insulator sequence is what? It's a DNA sequence. For an insulator sequence to work, what does it need? It's a DNA binding protein that's going to interact with that insulator. So the insulator binding protein. Well, if you methylate an insulator, it's actually known in this particular case, you have blocking of the binding of this insulator binding protein. So it turns out that there's now a regulatory sequence, again, one of these enhancers, that can now act on this gene that it otherwise was not able to act on. And this is, in fact, one of the ways that we found out about insulators in the first place, was having these genes that were being differentially regulated by exactly the same protein, certain distance away on the genome, wasn't working in a non-methylated state, but was working in order to activate the gene in <clears throat> a methylated state. So it's basically, you know, when we talked about this, we talked about regulation in bacterial transcription, a repressor, you remove the repressor, it's like having activation. So here it's the same kind of thing. You have otherwise repression due to an insulator element. You remove that insulator element, now you can have activation. So it's two wrongs making a right, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, there also is a nice new example, now that we're thinking a lot about these LNC RNAs, more acronyms, long non-coding RNAs, so not a protein coding RNA, as we'll see if we get there at the end. Um, these long non-coding RNAs, again, don't actually code for proteins, but they provide sequences usually for proteins to interact with. And so in this particular case, there's a promoter for one of these long non-coding RNAs, so not protein coding RNAs. That then will bind to a number of histone modifying enzymes, and these histone modifying enzymes, not surprisingly, since the gene is silenced, what do you think they're doing? What kind of modifications do you think they'll like to be making? Methylating those histones. So these will methylate the histones, compact this DNA, so you don't have expression from a different promoter on the other strand. So the other strand now is, is a protein coding strand, as opposed to the non-coding strand, which is on the opposite strand. Uh, here would make your protein now in the presence of methylation. What's this methylation doing? It's blocking the promoter for this long non-coding RNA. So default state, non-imprinted gene, long non-coding RNA that blocks things. On the other hand, if you have imprinting, then you'll be making this gene. So this is, these are two examples of actually relatively few where imprinting will actually activate a gene as opposed to inactivating a particular gene. Um, turns out that this is absolutely critical for fetal development. If you get rid of this imprinting, then you end up with mice in particular. We don't know about humans, but certainly in mice, uh, the expression of this particular gene um, incorrectly um, completely blocks fetal development. Yeah, your question. Yeah, this whole thing is called imprinting? So the imprinting process is actually back here. So imprinting is specific methylation on a sex-dependent basis. So that's where the imprinting is coming from. So specific methylation on a sex dependent basis, that's your imprinting, which can then lead to either repression of gene expression or stimulation of gene expression. Yeah? In the following example, yep. there, uh, it's activating gene expression by inactivating the deactivating LNC. <laughs> Yeah, so again, this is sort of this you know, backwards logic. Now, you're, you're, you're exactly right there. So you're activating a gene by blocking inactivation. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Clear as mud, as, as usual with many of these things. So these are also, um, as I mentioned before, nice examples of epigenetic inheritance. There's no change in the sequence. If it's, you know, 
dad's genes or mom's genes. It's going to be the modification of that particular DNA or that chromatin structure, which can be inherited. And so it's a non-genetic inheritance mechanism. And so that's the whole epigenetic um, inheritance idea, is it can be passed along from generation to generation or from cell to cell as cells divide, but it's not a change in the DNA sequence. And so there, there's this methylation, which is one of the forms of epigenetic modification. Histone modification we've talked about quite a bit. If you have one modification that's already there, your histone read writer complexes are going to bind to that modification and then write that same modification right next to it. And so that also gives you epigenetic inheritance. Last time, probably went over it too quickly, um, X inactivation works by exactly the same way. When you replicate the 2X chromosomes, if you're lucky enough to have 2X chromosomes, then after that replication, you've got to shut down one of those. And that shutdown state has to stay that shutdown state. And so this is another way. It's the histone modification, actually the whole chromatin modification, um, which is happening there. You can also have inheritance of a state, what the cell actually looks like, in what is also called these trans waves. Here this is cis because you have a modification to the DNA, which is then modifying what's happening next to it. These are these sort of positive feedback loops on a next door kind of thing. Last time we talked about positive feedback loops. This is also a way where basically the cell can remember what it was doing before it undergoes division. And this cell memory, again, it's an epigenetic inheritance. The cell divides. In this case, you've got your positive activator, which is activating itself. It will continue to activate itself. So all of the offspring here will have this activated state. There is no change in the DNA from the non-activated to the activated state, but this can also be maintained. And the last example, I'll get to your question in just a sec, um, is what happens with <clears throat> prion diseases um, that we talked about really briefly in terms of protein folding. It turns out that if you have a little bit of your unfolded protein in some of these protein folding diseases, particularly things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, et cetera, if you start to stimulate the unfolding and aggregation of some of these genes, and here this is the misfolded protein um, prion state, that's also maintained as that cell divides because this unfolded state down here at the bottom actually stimulates the normally folded proteins to unfold. Yeah, your question. Sorry. Um, so is there ever a time with the X inactivation where it doesn't just allow the cell to divide itself? Like, is it just one entire X chromosome, but it mixes and matches from both of them? Ah, so the question here is, uh, as far as X inactivation, this is just sort of going back to last lecture, uh, do you sometimes have part of one X which is inactivated and um, part of the other X which is inactivated? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case, and again, that's because we're usually doing this in cis, and so once it's started to modify that chromosome, it's going to spread on that one chromosome. It's not going to spread through the cell to the other chromosome. Uh, now, there are little exceptions to that, particularly the XIST, which is this long non-coding RNA, which is the important thing for shutting down that chromosome, that's still being expressed all the time. Um, but that's the, the very small parts of the chromosome that are still being expressed. And that's in the one chromosome. It turns out it's not being expressed in the other one, because if you're being expressed in the other one, then that one would get shut down as well. And there are a number of diseases. There's also some really interesting things that go on if you end up with XXYs or XYYs. So some really curious and fun stuff going on there, but We'll not get into it here. Take human genetics. I'll talk about it. Yeah. I got just a little lost in your explanation of the cis and trans. Mm -hmm. Can you try one more time? Oh. <laughs> one more time from the beginning. No. <laughs> um, yeah, no, certainly. Um, so the idea here with what's happening in cis versus what's happening in trans actually gets back to this previous question a little bit about the X chromosomes. Is it's what's happening in one place on the chromosome that is what's determining what happens after it gets replicated. So that particular piece of chromosome will be methylated in this case. It'll be associated with all of these modifications. And so it's that particular piece each time. 
On the other hand, down here, now you have something which is diffusing around the cell or the nucleus or wherever it happens to be. And so this can act on all chromosomes. It's not going to be a specific kind of case like we have with X inactivation, where it's just one of these chromosomes. Does that make more sense? Yes. Good. Yeah, cis versus trans is, you know, anyone in organic chemistry knows all about cis and trans, right? <laughs> Too much, probably. Um, so <clears throat> wrap up transcriptional regulation. Uh, this is nice review. Um, one of the things that I recommend to people when they're thinking about exams, which is happening far too soon, um, is these are really nice overview um, slides of going back and thinking about the stuff that we've talked about. So we talked a lot about DNA binding, helix turn helix, and various different methods for looking at DNA binding, uh, the bacterial repressors and activators, eukaryotes repressors and activators, and of course we've got this extra chromatin thing thrown in here for eukaryotes. And then last time we talked about a couple of examples of combinatorial control, multiple different proteins that are involved in transcriptional regulation. And actually this should really be transcriptional initiation regulation here. Various different circuits are positive feedback loops, to some extent some of the negative feedback loops. And then today we talked a little bit about epigenetics, again this last thing, and then specifically DNA methylation. So we have questions about transcriptional regulation. Yeah? What causes, uh, for example, once it's methylated, how do you demethylate? Ah, so the question is, once you're methylated, how do you demethylate? Um, there are methylases which will take care of you know, doing that demethylation. Turns out that, um, if you remember back to the imprinting slide, um, in embryogenesis, you end up with, and this is particularly in meiosis, almost all the methyl groups get stripped off. And then there are specific methylases which will come in and then remodify those ones that are important for imprinting, so a male-specific or a female-specific um, in that case. But that's a, a big sweep that gets rid of all those methyl groups. There are some methyl groups, oh, sorry, say DNA methylases, which will take off methyl groups on DNA. Those are a little bit rarer. You don't see those as much. But there certainly are, and particularly if you've got very specific methylations happening in one particular place, again, like for these imprinting, then you'll have, usually it's a sweep that takes them off, but sometimes if it's a regulated gene, there'll be a specific methylase that'll take things on and off. And we'll talk more about methylases next week when we talk about some of the cool techniques that people use for looking at methyl groups coming on and off. No, good, not a clicker question. Sorry. <laughs> There'll be more later, don't worry. Um, <laughs> so. Today, I just wanted to finish up with our regulation thing. And this is, <laughs> there are lots of courses actually just called bioregulation um, or gene regulation. We could do a whole term on regulation easily. And there are classes actually up the hill at OHSU in the biochemistry and molecular biology department where it's, that's exactly what they do. They spend a whole term um, talking about these things. So we're just going to zip over a number of different uh, kinds of now post-initiation I like to call this regulation. Uh, most people just call this post-transcriptional regulation, but so there's a lot of things that are happening here co-transcriptionally that people talk about as post-transcriptional regulation. Again, standard terminology is post-transcriptional. I like to think of it as post-transcriptional initiation regulation. So once you've started here, um, and sorry about this extra piece here, it says RNA transcript aborts um, right here after you've started your transcription. We've already talked a little bit about abortive initiation. This is what the polymerase will do. It'll just kick out a couple of nucleotides until it has the isomerization moving into the elongating state, which is highly processive. Basically, do you really want to transcribe this gene? Um, you can modify capping, modify splicing. You can have RNA editing and nuclear export. All of these are post-transcriptional regulation, and we'll talk about um, a number of examples of each of these. Once you have your message transported out of the nucleus, which is also, surprise, surprise, regulated, uh, then how much of that RNA gets translated, where it gets translated, and how long it sticks around are all important things that are going to determine how much protein you get, 
And what's missing on here? Talked about, I was like two lectures ago, chaperones. What are chaperones important for? Helping protein folding. So there's an even extra step here, regulation of, of protein folding um, that we could add on here um, down at the bottom. So <clears throat> just wanted to, again, cover each of these things ridiculously cursorially, just a very sort of high-level look at some of these different things. The first one that I wanted to talk about is what's called riboswitches or also transcriptional attenuation. And basically what happens here is the RNA polymerase stops too soon. But it's completely regulated at the RNA level. In this case, there's no protein involved whatsoever, which is really, I think, kind of fascinating. Um, and the way that this works is the messenger RNA that's made by the RNA polymerase. The vast majority of these are present in bacteria. Um, and that gives you an idea, why did I make this little squiggly line down here? It's not in your figure. Because bacteria don't have c terminal domains on their RNA polymerase. So this happens again almost always in bacterial systems. So the RNA polymerase is transcribing its gene, in this case, gene scripturian biosynthesis, and it makes this structure. This structure is called the riboswitch. It's also called an aptamer. Um, aptamers are just sequences of RNA that fold up into a particular structure. This particular aptamer binds to guanine. Guanine, of course, is a purine. The presence of guanine says, hey, we don't need to be making more guanine. Let's not bother to make any more guanine. So it turns out this aptamer binds to guanine. And that binding to guanine changes the structure of this RNA to give you a transcriptional terminator, our classic speed bump and oil, which then pops the RNA out of the polymerase, the polymerase terminates before it even has a chance to make all of these genes for curing biosynthesis. However, in the absence of guanine, this structure stays like this. The transcription terminator is never made. The genes are being transcribed. Yeah. So the question is, is basically, is it always? And I'm going to paraphrase your question a little bit here because we'll get we'll talk a little bit more about it. in the five prime UTR. So the five prime untranslated region. We're always making from you know, five prime to three prime here. Most of the time, it will be before you get to this AUG, before translation starts. And this makes perfect sense if you think about it from a bacterial point of view, because transcription and translation are always coupled. As soon as this AUG would come out of the ribosome, oh, sorry, the polymerase, the ribosome will bind onto it and start translating. So it's almost always in front of that. There are some cases, and we'll look at translational regulation in bacteria a little bit later on, with them saying it's actually downstream of the start uh, zone. But for the uh, most uh, part, uh, these ribo switches uh, are uh, upstream of the start zone. And again, the amazing uh, thing uh, here is it's uh, just the uh, RNA. Uh, just the uh, RNA, uh, no uh, proteins, uh, except, of course, for the uh, RNA polymerase, uh, um, where you're getting uh, regulation. Uh, yeah. yeah. OK, so, so let's uh, paraphrase uh, your question uh, a little uh, bit uh, here. It's, uh, it's uh, not uh, a protein. Uh, it's just the uh, RNA. Uh, and so, and so the RNA, the RNA is, is forming a structure, in this case, before it even gets to the place where you can start translation. And that structure, depending on the presence of the ligand here, the aptamers are all going to bind ligands, that guanine, in the absence of guanine, is going to keep going, and we'll make the AUG, and you'll get translation. In the presence of guanine, it changes the structure of this RNA in such a way to give you termination. And so, your RNA polymerase terminates before it ever gets to that start code. Yeah, in the back. 
Yeah, so the question is, um, does adenine do the same thing here? Um, curiously enough, in this particular case, it doesn't. It's just guanine, which does this regulation. But it's just one case. There are all kinds of different aptamers. And again, these are RNA sequences that form structures that will bind to something. Um, and there are some adenine riboswitches as well. So this particular case, it turns out it's just guanine. And it's not terribly surprising, because that interaction is going to be pretty specific. Um, how what that's folded up to do. And there's actually, I think, in the text, I think some images of that Hawani interacting with this rival switch. I didn't um, add it to my lecture. Okay, so that's just the <coughs> RNA um, aspect of things. We talked about alternative splicing before. Alternative splicing, yeah, you can make you know, these you know, gazillion, well, not really gazillion, 38,016 uh, different possibilities. And there's one gene in Drosophila. We already talked about that before. But the presence of this alternative splicing, if you had just random mixtures of splicing that's happening all the time, it would be really a mess. And we talked about the RG versus the RS or SR proteins in terms of which exons are being used, which exons are not being used. That's because alternative splicing doesn't happen most of the time. Again, as seen down here, all the gray exons are being used all the time. But you have a number of different kinds of options here. Curiously enough, in yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you have a relatively small amount of alternatively spliced genes. In humans, a whole bunch. And usually the way that alternative splicing works is that you will block one of the normal splice sites. Um, and so here, for instance, down at the bottom here, um, this is your normal splice site over here on the top. You block splicing from happening here. Then you'll have some splicing that happens in a different place. So usually it's this blocking of normal splice sites. And that makes sense, because if you think about the way transcription is working, you're making the messenger RNA. And as that messenger RNA is being made, most of the time you have sequential splicing that takes place. And so is blocking splicing is much more likely than actually stimulating splicing. There are a couple of examples where you're going to stimulate splicing, but for the most part, it's just blocking your normal splice site. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the, again, I'm going to paraphrase your question here. I'm um, sorry. Uh, but what's causing this, you know, differential kind of use of the exons is usually proteins, as far as we can tell, that are binding to exons, and particularly those exon junctions, so it's the SR proteins, the RG proteins. So RG don't use this, SR use this. Um, and then interacting with U2 in terms of getting U2AF and getting U2, particularly at that, if you think about it from the intron point of view, at the three prime end of the intron. So it's finding that three prime end of the intron, which is really the critical part of what's going on here. Uh, because of this kind of splicing, uh, probably everybody's heard about you know, one gene, one protein. No, it's not one gene, one protein, particularly if you've got 75% of your genes being differentially spliced. One gene, lots of different potentially polypeptides, but almost all of them are going to have the same N terminus, because that's what's coming out at the beginning of the gene. It's really going to be what's going on at the C terminus, which is different for your protein. Now let's look at an example of that. This particular one is why at the post-seminar receptions, we had all of these bizarre flies crawling around our fruit bowls, um, sex homes reduced, etc. Um, sex lethal is probably the best known of these gene regulatory proteins. In fact, the guy whose lab was right downstairs where we had our receptions, that's what we discovered. So they were working on sex determination in fruit flies. It turns out to be very different in the way it works in mammals. But um, the way that sex determination works in fruit flies, it's a calculation of the ratio of X chromosomes to autosomes. Um, and this is measured. We're not going to get into how this is actually being measured. But that leads into this sex lethal gene. Sex lethal has two different kinds of splicing that can take place. If you have a 
0.5, and it turns out you can have four X's and two autosomes, etc. cetera. Um, anytime you've got a, a, a point, I think, two autosomes and one X, or four autosomes and two X's, uh, anytime this ratio is showing five, you have a normal slice site, which gives you a non-functional protein. On the other hand, if you have a normal X to autosome ratio, which it implies is one, um, then this splice site is blocked, and you end up with a full-length protein, which is now a active protein. This active protein is a splicing repressor. So getting back to your question, how does this, did this determination take place? It binds now to messenger RNA of the transformer gene, and we'll get back and talk about these things in just a second here. Um, that transformer gene is also a splicing regulator, but now it's a splicing activator. And so this will activate an earlier splice site than in the absence of active transformer gene, and that will give you a exon which you completely lost. This again, just like we talked about, gives you different C-termini of your proteins. And this particular protein, the double sex protein, has either male-specific C-terminus or female-specific C-terminus. Double sex is a transcriptional regulator. Actually, it's a repressor. So the double sex protein that has these male-specific amino acids Give you one guess where the DNA binding domain is for this protein. Down here, at this end. Um, that will repress the female differentiation genes, and this alternative C terminus will repress the male differentiation genes. This tells you immediately why it's called double sex. If you get rid of that gene, as all of the Drosophila geneticists do, what do you end up with? You end up with that why that's expressing both male and female specific genes. And I'll let you think about what would happen if you're lacking this transformer gene. I'll talk more about it next time. But just think about what a mutation in the transformer gene um, would do. No, I'm not going to ask it to click the question. Don't worry. So it's all that could be on the test. We'll see. Uh, but the idea here is it's all about splicing regulation. It's making a splicing repressor, the sex lethal gene, which then that repression of splicing leads to the expression of an activator of splicing. And that then ends up with differential C termini, which turn out to be the DNA binding. So that changes the C-termini. Another way, not surprisingly, to change C-termini has to do with what's happening at the very 3' end of your gene. Where splicing takes place will change that C-terminus, but also where you put your poly A tail can change where the C-terminus of your protein is. How do you get poly A tail formation? Among other things, it's the amount of your cleavage and stimulation factor, CSTF, and, as we all remember, right, um, termination, which has to do with when you have this cleavage of your messenger RNA, is happening co-transcriptionally. So if you have a low concentration of one of these proteins, it's important for getting tailing to take place, you may have transcribed far enough along before that's had a chance to come and bind to the messenger RNA. So in case we have low amounts of these cleavage stimulation factors, you're going to skip some of these poly A type um, tail sites. So here you end up with a long transcript, and here you end up with a short transcript. And that's because with high amounts of CSCF, you're going to cut early. Low amounts of CSCF, you'll cut late. Here, if you cut early, because we've got CSCF high, it turns out that cut site is right in the middle of an intron. If it's right in the middle of an intron, you can't splice this out anymore. 
And if you don't splice it out, you end up with a short protein with its stop code right in the middle. If, however, it takes a while before you cut and poly a tail, you can make this particular intron that gets cut out, and so now you have a alternative end piece use. This is exactly what happens in antibody production, B cells. Anybody taking or took immunology? Yes, no? When you do take immunology, they're all about these things. Um, <clears throat> you have secreted antibodies and cellular antibodies. Now, how do you get secreted versus cellular? Cellular one sticks in the membrane of the cell. How does it stick in the membrane of the cell? And a bunch of hydrophobic amino acids. Hydrophobic amino acids love to associate with cells. This is exactly what happens in this particular case. So, making of antibodies by B cells, if you have a low amount of CSTF, you're going to make antibodies here, which are bound to the membrane because they've got this extra hydrophobic piece that gets made by this messenger RNA. If, however, you've got a lot of this CSTF around, you'll cut in this intron before the processing machinery has a chance to take it out. This will end up with a short piece that no longer has a hydrophobic piece that's attached to it, and this will be secreted, go off and fight all of the nasty invaders that are coming inside your cells. So, alternative splicing, alternative tailing. Um, there's also this really bizarre thing that happens to RNA called RNA editing. Why RNA editing here takes place, we really don't know, but there's quite a lot of RNA editing that takes place. Um, probably the best known of these are what are called the ADAR enzymes, so adenosine deaminase associated with RNA. What does adenosine deamination do? It changes adenosine to inosine. Good sound vaguely familiar. Where did we see that before? In a scene in wobble, in tRNA, exactly. So first position of your anticode on. But you're now changing adenine to adenosine, uh, so in a scene, excuse me, in the mRNA. So what does that mean? In a scene compared just like it does with the wobble position. So this can also change what kind of amino acid to be put into that particular part of your protein. How do these ADAR enzymes work? The vast majority of them bind to specific double-stranded pieces of RNA, usually that are also part of an intron. So this is also a modification that happens while transcription is taking place. The adenosine deaminase that acts on RNA will interact with the sequence and change this uh, adenine here to an inosine. And it turns out that this is absolutely critical for brain development. If you didn't have this kind of modification, you didn't have inosines that happen here. Um, it's been done in mice. Um, people don't actually have these kinds of mutations because they die. They never actually make it through development. Uh, this kind of modification turns out to be absolutely critical for development. Turns out that there's also a whole set of these modification enzymes that are specific for retroviruses. Retroviruses like HIV, like 8% of our genome are these retroviruses. There's remnants of a lot of these retroviruses. One of the ways that we've evolved to deal with this is when RNA from these retroviruses comes inside a cell, these apobank proteins will modify that RNA so much that it can't be functional anymore. Of course, this is a balance. Everyone's heard about HIV mutates really fast. Well, it turns out that there's going to be a balance between the mutations that happen and that are going to be potentially useful, drug resistance, et cetera, but then also those that are overwhelming and have this um, kind of issue. There are other RNA editing that takes place, plants, trisanosomes. Main thing that happens here, these are poly U's that get added to some of these genes. It's a literally an insertion event that takes place, and there are guide RNAs that do this. Where have we seen guide RNAs before? I know they finally signed in two weeks. Why should I remember these things? 
Um, so guide RNAs are going to be RNAs that have a specific sequence that leads to a particular modification. Proteins that are going to do the modification. Yeah. Exactly. Just like the snow RNA. So the small nuclear RNAs, which will base pair and then lead to a specific change, you could do to a protein. Just going to do that. It's exactly what happens here is you've got an RNA bringing that particular protein. And it turns out it's probably how a lot of these, these long coding RNAs are working too. Again, it's a RNA sequence, base pairing in some cases, these long coding RNAs. So they'll bring in a protein that will do some modifications that take place. Uh, one example of this RNA editing is some very specific liver proteins. Um, it's actually not deamination, which as you see, we're going from a C to a U residue here. Um, again, this is really part of the problem is that all of our cells have exactly the same DNA in them. They've got all exactly the same DNA in them. How can you make different proteins that are doing different things? Well, one way you can do it is by doing RNA editing. So liver genes have this sequence. Intestine genes have this sequence. But there's no editing that takes place in the liver, but there is editing that takes place in the intestine, and in this case, gives you a new stop code. CAA codes, I can't remember the genetic code, I don't remember, I expect you to remember it. Um, UAA stop codon, right in the middle of the gene, your protein just ends up being short. And because of this difference in sequence, it's going to have a different function, a structure function um, relation to these guys. So, so RNA editing can give you premature stops. You can also get modifications with splicing, modifications with tailing. Once you've modified your whole RNA, this is all still happening. We talked about before, this is a co-transcriptional modification which is happening. Now you need to get that messenger RNA out of the nucleus so the cytoplasm can actually get translated. So, how does that work? We talked about this before. It's all of the nuclear export proteins looking, again, to the other amplifiers at your RNA, making sure it's spliced, making sure it's capped, etc. Uh, it turns out that a number of viruses, particularly retroviruses, have these RNAs. They need to get out of the nucleus in a non spliced state. So it turns out that they have specific proteins that they make, the, pro the virus makes, which basically tricks the nuclear export machinery. And these proteins, in this case it's called the Rev protein, uh, to then go back into the nucleus, binds to unspliced RNA, and transports it out into the cytoplasm where it can get made into a whole new virus. This is just a really good example. But there are other examples as well of where nuclear export gets regulated. Well, now we finally got our messenger RNA out of the nucleus. What do we need to do with it? Translate. And also where this particular RNA gets translated is very important. You remember the Bicoid and Hunchback and all of the other regulators, Giant, Purple, et cetera, in terms of even skips? You remember this big gradient of bicoid and hunchback from the anterior end going down to the posterior end? How does that work? How do you get one of these gradients? Well, one of the ways you can get this gradient is by having the messenger RNA in the embryo stuck at a particular place in the embryo. If it's getting translated in that position, then you're going to have more of that protein there and it can diffuse the rest of the way down the embryo. It turns out that's exactly how you get the ingredients of bicoid and hunchback, is that the messenger RNAs are stuck at one end of the embryo. How are they put there? Mostly through sequences in the three prime untranslated region. So we've talked quite a bit about the five prime untranslated region, that's the ribo switches, et cetera. The three prime untranslated region also can form particular structures, which can then bind to places in cells or places in the embryo in order to get localization. And that's how we get <coughs> specific locations inside, inside a particular cell, or again, in the case of the embryo, it's one big cell and one particular place. So <coughs> review.
all of these things. I have a clicker question. Turn it back on. Um, generate a C terminus of a protein with an alternative sequence. Start. Um, which of the following methods of post transcriptional regulation, post transcriptional initiation regulation, we most like ribo switch, alternative splicing, RNA editing by ADAR, RNA export, or messenger RNA localization? We actually had an example of this that we talked about. Yay, yes, yes, there are alternative splicing. We talked about the <coughs> B cells and antibody production. Okay, we have our modified messenger RNA. It's been exported to the cytoplasm. Now it needs to be translated. How is translation control? Um, we already talked about what was going on with some of these ribo switches in terms of transcriptional termination. It turns out that this can also regulate translation. How is translation mostly being regulated? It's mostly just the presence of the AUG. If you have an AUG that the small subunit of the ribosome can bind to, then you'll get translation. If you have an AUG, which is in some kind of secondary structure, or blocked by some kind of other protein that's associated with it, you're not going to get translation. Yeah, in the back. Okay, I'm a little confused by your question, but basically the idea here is that AUG can't, well, back up a little. So AUG has to be available for the ribosome to associate with. And if the AUG is not available for the ribosome to associate with, you're not going to get translation. And so that could be through base pairing interactions, which is what we have down here, or it could also just be a protein which is bound to the RNA and blocking access to this AUG. You can have small RNAs, so these guide RNAs, for instance, they're going to base pair, block the AUG because it's in a base pairing interaction. And this, what are called antisense RNAs, are really good ways of shutting down translation. Because once it's in a double strand, you can't get the initiator tRNA to associate with it. Uh, one of my favorites is this one up here that a buddy of mine, to be perfectly honest, works on. Uh, it's what it's called a um, RNA thermometer. So at a low temperature, there's a secondary structure that forms. But if you heat this up, just like you do with DNA, the base pairs are going to break. And that allows the AUG to be used. So all three of these ways can regulate translation. And the main thing which is being regulated here, again, is just the access to that AUG. You have to get your initiator tRNA to the AUG in order to get translation to take place. So four different ways that that can happen here. Another thing that has to happen with your initiator tRNA, how do you need to, how does the initiator tRNA associate with the AUG. What do we need in order to get that association? EIF2, exactly. Ian's reading the slides. Good. <laughs> EIF2 also has to be bound to GTP, because it's that GTP hydrolysis which gives you the assembly of the full translational initiation complex. How do you get EIF to GTP? Well, it turns out that just like for almost all of the other GTP binding proteins that we've talked about, you need a guanosine nucleotide exchange factor. 
um, here, AAF to B. EF to B recycles this GCP bound form, GDP bound after you've done initiation. We'll recycle through this again and again and again. This is great if you want to see nucleotide exchange factor can interact with EF2. One of the things that cells do if they get stressed, really nice stress, of course, being infected by a virus, is they will phosphorylate EIF2. Why is EIF2 phosphorylated? Once EIF2 is phosphorylated, it can no longer actively interact with EIF2B, so you don't get active EIF2, which shuts down translation. Remember, this is a really good thing to do if you're infected by a virus, because all viruses require translation from the cell. So, a bunch of you signed up for virology next term. We'll talk a lot more about this um, in that case. And of course, viruses know this, again, to totally over-anthropomorphize, and have figured out ways to get around this. Turns out this is also used, however, in normal cell cycling. A lot of cells in our body are what's called G0, the resting state of the cell cycle. Not translating very many genes. We talked about before, translation is incredibly dependent on lots of NTP hydrolysis. Shutting down translational initiation also is going to save you a lot of energy. And so, is also in a normal process um, of phosphorylation of EIF2 giving you this. So, it's access to your, your AUG or what you need to have with your initiator tRNA to bring it in to get translation initiation. Yeah. So, the question is when, it's, when there's cell stress, what happens? It turns out that in cell stress, very often you will phosphorylate. Um, <coughs> excuse me, EIF2, and that will block new translational initiation. And so it really does shut down translation pretty well. Yeah, in the back. Okay, yeah, so the question is basically what happens to EIF2 after it gets phosphorylated. There's also a phosphatase, um, which you can come in and take that off and you can restart that whole process. That's exactly what happens when you have a cell which is in the G0 phase of the cell cycle, but then moves back into the regular cell cycle. Phosphatase comes in and takes it off. You can have the normal cycling process that takes place. Finish up with this last example of translational regulation. Maybe the last one. Um, having to do with, again, thinking about translation. What do you need for translation? You need the initiator tRNA, you need the AUG, but also, think about eukaryotic translational initiation. The ribosome is scanning along that messenger RNA looking for the first AUG sequence. If you have low amounts of ribosome scanning, Sometimes you'll skip some of the earlier AUGs, and this happens at low, at, sorry, excuse me, high. Yeah, yeah, 4F, yeah, 4F is 4G and 4E together, both of them together. On the other hand, if you have low amounts of EIF2, then you'll scan much more across your RNA and end up with AUGs which are a little bit further downstream. Um, this is discussed quite nicely in the text, um, but you can also just think about the amounts of these different proteins and why it should cause earlier AUGs or later AUGs to be used. Um, George will talk about CRISPRs, small RNAs, and maybe about some of the rest of the stuff in this lecture. I'm going to leave that up to him. Um, see you on Friday. And good seminar tomorrow, noon. Okay, yeah, best thing to do is send me an email, um, and as long as it's got your Odin username in it, I can figure out more or less where you stand. Um, the other thing you can do is just add up your two exam scores and divide it by 80, that'll give you a percentage. Divide by 80, and then look and see where that is in my rubric. Just go 90% plus is an A, etc. Okay, so yeah. like, the curve, what happened, That's, that's
Right, add the right, two together, 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 divide by 80, by 80 which okay. is about okay. what's going to be normalized okay. to at this rate, and that'll give you a pretty good idea of where you can Okay, like, so it's more right now? Yeah, they're 10 percent, and I can, I can look up your clickers if you want. I can certainly do that, but um, it probably, I think you're probably doing okay with your clickers. Yeah, and if it looks like your clicker number, you're usually pretty close to right most of the time. Yeah, so it's probably not going to make a big difference. Yeah, yeah, but I just a couple of things. Welcome. Hi. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's the first day I didn't. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll I'll definitely bring them on Friday. Yeah. Um, if there is if there is something specific on there, we can certainly take a look at it. And I can talk to me. Yeah. I know you. So. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, well, we can take a look and let's see. Oh, I was maybe the other the other woman who was here is um, take your total score divided by 80 and see where your percentage is based on in my first lecture, the very first lecture notes. I've got you know, a breakdown in terms of what grade that is, more or less. And that'll give you kind of an idea where you stand. Yep. Yeah. Sounds good.